Hello, and welcome back to The Independent Pianist. I'm your host, Cole Anderson, as always. Today, I am once again continuing my series on great pianists with an artist who is very close to my heart. Uh, this is, of course, Wilhelm Kempf. If you don't know Wilhelm Kempf's playing yet, you should definitely get to know him. He had a rather understated but highly poetic temperament, and as a musician, his approach to music and the piano was an enormous inspiration to me in my younger years, a teenager in my early 20s, and still to this day. Now, when I discovered Kemp for the first time, I had been used to a lot of very romantic pianists, uh, Rachmaninoff, Corto, Moisevich, Friedman, and, and the like. They were really my earliest influences, uh, but Kemp had something very different, although equally inspiring, to offer me. So, before I really dive into what made Kempf really special, I want to get one caveat out of the way first. Uh, it is true that Kempf, especially in his later years, had certain mechanical limitations in his playing. Uh, particularly when you hear live recordings from late in his life, it's easy to tell that there were times when he would struggle a little bit, particularly towards the start of a program. And he definitely challenged himself. He would start programs with pieces like the Bach Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue, which starts off with a very exposed, tricky run, or the Schumann G minor Sonata. You know, that piece also has a very fiddly, tricky opening, and he wasn't always quite up to it in every situation. I've found this myself, and I've heard it described by many artists, including artists of uh, stature of uh, William Capel, that the first 15 minutes of a recital oftentimes feel like they're kind of wasted. Uh, like nothing really good happens there, where you're kind of uh, getting your nerves out, getting used to the audience and, and the feel of the hall. Uh, there's many examples of things happening at the beginning of concerts owing to nerves, I'm sure. Most of my viewers are probably familiar with the famous slip at the very beginning of uh, Horowitz's famous 1965 return concert in Carnegie Hall. And I've also oftentimes found it very difficult to program the opening piece in a concert. On the one hand, you want to play something that's very arresting and powerful, but on the other, what with the nerves or being cold when you start, it's oftentimes very difficult to find warm-up pianos. You know, we, we don't have an instrument that we can carry around like a violinist. Um, it's always kind of a risk starting with something that's really exposed. So it is interesting that someone like Kempf, who wasn't necessarily the most technically gifted of pianists, really didn't mind challenging himself in that way. Now, actually, I think a lot of the problem with Kemp's recordings is that the vast majority of them are from when he was past 50. Uh, many of his recordings that you hear a lot, like his second Beethoven cycle, I think he was even in his 60s or into his 70s. And his technique really just didn't hold up quite as well in his later years as some other artists. Uh, when he was younger, he did have plenty of technique to burn, actually. But putting that aside, even when Kemp did have technical problems, his enormous musical insight and control almost always compensated for it. He plays so beautifully and in such an unaffected way that you usually don't even care about a certain amount of awkwardness here and there. You start to not even notice it anymore. His vision of the piece as a whole is very compelling, and everything really holds together very well. So from here on out, I'm not even really going to mention technical shortcomings. I view them simply as little scratches on the surface of a painting by a great artist. Uh, the number one thing about his playing that was very inspiring to me as a young person was his absolutely unflappable sense of internal pulse. Uh, I don't think you'll ever hear Kempf rush in any performance, except only when he chooses to. There's really only three other pianists who have given me a similar sense of just rock-like security in their internal rhythm. Uh, sound, it just sounds like they never, ever rush. Uh, there are three very different artists, actually. The first would be Sergei Rachmaninoff, the second would be Ignaz Jan Paderewski, and the third, Glenn Gould. So very different, all of them, but they all share with Kemp this kind of effortlessly powerful control over forward momentum. There were many times in Kemp's performances where he revealed things about pieces to me, pieces that I thought that I knew up to that time uh, through this use of tempo control. He sometimes could make very grand musical ideas stand forth in great clarity. And a major part of this was his selection of sometimes significantly slower uh, tempi uh, that were surprisingly effective and his refusal to rush. And this is very important because I would say that 90% of musicians, especially when under pressure, and especially in passages of extreme emotional power and technical difficulty, will push ahead and accelerate the tempo, even if it's just slightly. And sometimes this can be very effective, but just as often it can be disastrous, or at the very least rob the music of its strength. So let's get down to an actual example of this. 
So first, I want to play an excerpt from a 1958 recording of Liszt's Second Legend. If you don't know these pieces, they deal with Christian legend. Uh, Liszt, of course, was a mystic and uh, had minor holy orders in the Catholic Church. The first legend deals with St. Francis of Assisi preaching to the birds, and the second one is supposed to depict St. Francis of Paola walking on the waves. I have long admired these legends. I think they're some of Liszt's most inspiring and colorful works, and Liszt played them often in his later years in impromptu performances, so evidently he was very proud of them as well. Before I heard Kempf play this piece, I had never been completely convinced uh, by any performance I'd heard. To me, there was always something a little too technically distracting about certain sections of the piece, particularly in this passage. This is the first huge climax in the piece. It's extremely awkwardly written for Liszt. It has huge jumps, it's very hard to play accurately, and generally what happens is that the rhythm is kind of approximated here with all the tricky leaps. The double thirds get rushed. In general, people usually speed up far before where Liszt actually marks a cello rondo. Uh, this is because Liszt marks stringendo a few times, so small accelerations of tempo. But that only applies to those uh, single parts. The rest of it with the jumps is not supposed to speed up until Liszt marks a cello rondo. So generally this passage ends up sounding a bit too much like a tightrope act. Usually people miss some of the jumps and here, those kinds of misfires are actually a little bit distracting. It makes it sound distinctly like a piano piece and kind of takes you out of the whole feeling of water. So just for comparison, I'll play a live recording by Vladimir Horowitz of this piece. Um, I have to apologize here. Uh, I don't mean to highlight a, a particularly bad recording of Horowitz's. I, I think this is, is not him at his best. Uh, Horowitz was a great artist, of course, and I'm sure he could have done way better. But I think it's a very good example of the sort of mishap that can happen in live performance when uh, you take a lot of risks and you kind of let the tempo run away from you. I happen to really admire that he took a lot of risks, but in this case, it hurts the music a little bit when he lets the tempo just accelerate so uh, erratically. Let's try Kemp's recording. If you followed the marks in the score, you may have heard some of what I'm talking about. The kind of tension that he creates in this passage by holding the tempo back. I've never heard any other performance which has created such an incredible effect. It really sounds so vividly like huge towering waves that are just kind of rising up 
to engulf you as you listen. And he does accelerate quite wildly at the end. You know, he really gives the payoff, but only when List marks it, and only because he chooses to do so, not because he's losing control. You know, in the Horowitz version, uh, he's already accelerated so much by the time the Accelerando is marked that there's not much left to do. So sometimes it's, it's almost an advantage to have a little less technique. Sometimes having a lot of technique, Horowitz was definitely a very technically gifted artist, can actually lead you down the garden path a little bit because your fingers can do something, so you kind of just let them do it, and it ends up kind of messing up the music, actually. And I think if you search through recordings, you won't find very many that hold back in this passage in this way. There are some other very good recordings of this piece, but um, no one quite makes the effect Kempf gets here, so it's, it's pretty unique in its own way. So for me, at the time I first heard this, I don't know exactly when that was, in my teens or something, and I, I heard it again in my 20s, I found it to be really inspiring because uh, I had major problems with rushing, and I'm sure I still do it now sometimes, especially when I'm under pressure. Uh, there were times when I struggled a lot because I thought I always had to play fast to get excitement, so I was always constantly pushing the edge of my technical boundaries, and I, without even realizing it oftentimes. But Kempf was one of the pianists who taught me that, in fact, that's not the case, that sometimes less is more, uh, sometimes you can create incredible power without needing to push speed to the absolute max. And in fact, to be really in charge of the music, your sense of tempo should be separate from your sense of technical ease or difficulty. And since then, I've really come to the conclusion that a powerful control of tempo is the most useful and effective thing in music making in general, and Kempf really had it. This piece is, of course, not the typical side of Kemp's playing that you might be used to if you're already familiar with his work. That's why I particularly wanted to highlight it, because he actually had an enormous range when he wanted to. Uh, but he was much more famous for his kind of refined, elegant approach to lyrical music. And there's one particular magical recording, which I just have to play here, not because it makes a particular point, but just because I think it's one of the most beautiful recordings I've ever heard. And that is the second movement from the Chopin F minor concerto. This is a live recording. When I listen to recordings like this and many others by Kempf, I'm always forced to consider what is it that makes his playing so special? You know, his playing is so understated. There's not a lot of things that are obvious that he's doing that really uh, contribute to this. And it would be simple to just take a t kind of cop out and say, oh, he has a beautiful singing tone. He understands the music or something like that. But that doesn't really tell us anything specific. You know, we can tell he plays beautifully, but why? Why does it uh, affect, at least me, so powerfully? Well, I think we can go a long way toward describing what it is that's special about his playing if we notice some very interesting kind of influences in his artistic personality. 
Uh, first of all, he was trained in the Germanic tradition of the early 20th century. I don't mean to pigeonhole him, but it's just a fact. I mean, his first teacher was Heinrich Barth, who was one of the most well-known pedagogues in Berlin at the end of the 19th century into the 20th. For those of you who are aficionados in this area, he was basically the only major piano teacher that Arthur Rubinstein ever had, and Rubinstein got a lot from him. Barth was a very difficult man, though. He was famously irascible and hard on his students, uh, Rubinstein was pretty thick-skinned, and he survived just fine, but Kempf was a little more sensitive in his nature, and he couldn't really put up with all of Barth's browbeating. So I, I think he moved on fairly quickly, actually. Still, I think that Kempf probably got a lot of uh, basic things from Barth. Uh, you can notice there's certain similarities in the way that Kempf and Rubinstein play the piano in their carriage and physical approach. Um, also, their habit of very rarely looking at the keys that probably can be traced back to Barth. At any rate, I think from this training, Kempf imbibed certain qualities of playing that were typical of the approach of the German school at that time, and which probably could be traced back to the influence of figures like Felix Mendelssohn, Clara Schumann, and so forth. There is a certain restraint, a simplicity, a control in the handling of rhythm and tempo, an avoidance of extremes of tempo that Kempf has, which I also associate with other musicians who were trained in this style. Uh, we could name, I mean, Arthur Rubinstein, to a certain extent, is representative of that, that style, even though he was a little more freewheeling and colorful than many others. Um, others that I could mention would be people like Claudio Arau or uh, Rudolf Serkin. The way that Kemp really deviates from people like Arau and Serkin, and a way in which he's a little bit more similar to an artist like Rubinstein or um, Russian pianists, for example, from the, from the late 19th century, is there's a kind of delight in the pure sensuous pleasure of sound in Kemp's playing. Uh, you can tell that he really just enjoys making a beautiful sound and finding beautiful sounds. There's a certain freedom in his pedaling, uh, a lack of four squareness, which is also, I think, a little unusual in, in many of those uh, Germanic trained pianists. He sometimes will go on for very long pedaling or very interesting kind of pedals that he'll do that are not what I typically associate with that, that school. Kempf also oftentimes makes use of the romantic idea of playing his hands not quite together in a very subtle and restrained way, certainly not as, not as exaggerated as you might hear in Courtauld or Rachmaninoff's recordings. But uh, still, at the same time, that's very unusual for that school of, of playing. You'll never hear, for example, Arthur Rubinstein play with his hands not quite lining up, or uh, Claudio Orao, another one. They had a much more kind of strict approach to this aspect of piano sound. He also had a wonderfully subtle sense of balancing chords and voicing lines, which goes hand in hand with that kind of freedom with uh, rolling chords, as well as a somewhat relaxed view towards textual fidelity as well. He was much more willing to deviate from the text in the spirit of the inspiration of the moment than some of his colleagues. This might be why Brendel once said famously that Kempf played on impulse and that if the right kind of breeze was blowing on a particular evening, you could take something home from his concerts that you never heard anywhere else. So all of these qualities combined with his very natural flowing tempi, you know, he never takes extremely slow or extremely fast tempos, he just never does it, that gives his music a very unforced kind of lyricism. Everything he plays really sounds kind of like a folk song. There's something very inevitable, childlike, and in the end, very deeply meaningful. So there are many recordings that I could use to show his artistry, but I've chosen only two of my favorites. Uh, one is a rather an infrequently played piece by itself from Opus 118 by Brahms. This is the Romance in F major. For me, this is one of the most beautiful of all Brahms pieces. I've put some markings in the score, uh, but notice the very subtle fluctuations in tempo, the exquisite, very subtle voicing, the slight arpeggios that he adds to the chords, as well as this very lovely, very romantic style of pedaling. 
Then I wanted to also give a little excerpt from another wonderful recording, one of my favorites of his. This is the second movement from one of Schubert's least known works. It's a two movement sonata from early on in his career. It's uh, grouped as one of the unfinished pieces, although I think he might have actually meant it to be a uh, kind of a homage to Beethoven's Opus 90 two movement sonata. At any rate, notice how Kempf uses different kinds of pedaling to mirror the changes in mood in the harmonies. It makes a wonderful effect, and it's so perfectly reflective of his sensitivity. section, just listen to the incredible control he shows in voicing the right hand. You know, he plays the 16th note accompaniment in the right hand so softly and gently that he can afford to play the melody on top also very quietly and very beautifully phrased. So there's a kind of gentle softness that this lends his sound, which is really extraordinary. So I hope this has gotten you intrigued about this wonderful pianist. He was very much a gentleman and a poet among artists. And you don't tend to hear pianists who sound like this nowadays very often, you know. So I think uh, Kemp's recordings are a treasure trove to be examined and relished. In today's uh, world where there is such a focus on technical perfection, perhaps fostered by the recording industry, it's really refreshing to see someone who is so naturally engaged with the music and really had his heart in the right place, I think. He really had such a gentle and thoughtful way of engaging with music. I didn't really get a chance to mention his work as a composer or arranger. We don't really have space for it here. He does have many beautiful arrangements, and he was unusual in that he always played his own cadenzas in Mozart and Beethoven concertos, and I think that's a wonderful idea, and we should all do that more, try to get our own creative juices flowing, even if we love playing the classics. So thank you again very much for watching. Please do consider becoming a financial supporter of this channel. Uh, any amount uh, will help me to continue bringing you this content, uh, but uh, I have several different methods you can use. One very easy one is www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist, and there you can sign up for monthly pledges, but you can also make one-time donations. I have links to PayPal and Venmo and various other things like that. And if you want to study with me also, uh, you can drop me a line at call at independentpianist.com. I can share my rates and we can have a free consultation if you'd like that. But otherwise, uh, until next time, I'll, I should have another performance video of myself next week with some analysis and commentary, so stay tuned for that. And until then, keep practicing. Uh, take care, stay healthy, and uh, I'll see you all next time.